Hey everyone, Remy here. Welcome to episode one of the Real Talk Real Estate Podcast. Me and Steve get some interesting topics, some heated uh, topics on this first episode slash episode three, but the first podcast. So hopefully you enjoy. Let's get into it. All right, everybody. Welcome to Real Talk Real Estate. This is Remy Morvan, broker and owner at Capital Homes Realty, and I'm here with Steve Benson. Uh, this is episode three, technically episode one of the podcast series. There's two video series, but we're going to start putting in audio form because there's no point on looking at me uh, and my ugly face for 20 minutes. So, uh, Steve, welcome. Hopefully, Steve will be a co-host. We'll see if he wants to keep doing this with me. But uh, we want to talk about the truth of real estate and uh, give you guys as much value as we can ahead of time. And, you know, we're not going to tell you what you want to hear. We're going to tell you what uh, you should hear. So, Steve, thanks for coming on board. Hey, my pleasure. Happy to be here. Yeah, so uh, things in Ottawa are going pretty well. Uh, I'm currently, I'm going to be speaking this week in Kingston. We got our whole, a bunch of our crew going down there, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, the Emerge conferences, the people there do a really good job. Uh, Steve's going to be coming, and uh, Josh and a whole bunch of our other agents, so it's going to be a lot of fun. If you're in Ottawa uh, and you want to head down to Kingston, if you're an Ottawa agent going down, you should really do it this this Thursday uh, in Kingston happening uh or emerge conferences. So let's get into it. Uh, basically, for this episode, I want to hit a few points uh, and I actually want to bring Steve's Medium post. Steve uh, blogs on the website Medium and he wrote a good article on the truth about listing in the winter. So I want to get a good conversation going in regards to why the hell would an agent try to get you to list in the winter. So Steve, if you want to just explain a bit of the premise behind your article. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the idea of the article was, you know, people, there's never a bad time for an agent to take a listing, mainly because their sign gets to be put in the front yard. So having signs in front yards, like mini little billboards all around the neighborhood. So my thought is, if you, if you want to list your house and you have the ability to list in the spring, why wouldn't you? It's a, it's a known fact that you sell more homes then, there's more people looking, it's springtime, it's getting a little bit nicer out. So why not do that? So then why, why would an agent ever try to convince someone? So like you said, it's mini billboards. So um, when you do the actual math of sales versus inventory in the winter, you're actually at a disadvantage because there are definitely, there is less competition. That's what a lot of agents will tell you, say, oh, we should list now because there's not yeah. as much inventory. But realistically, the difference in number of sales is so great that you're actually at a statistical disadvantage listing in the winter, even regardless if there's less competition because there's so many less buyers. So it's definitely, uh, people are still looking and it yeah. could be a definite advantage for the realtor to get more more leads. I've actually had two, two listing appointments um, in the last little while and uh, I told them both that we're gonna list in the spring and because it's just not worth it to have the house sit there and the days on market continue to go up and up and up and just doesn't make any sense. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, it's to ask those questions because the only reason you should list in the winter is if you really, really have to, if yeah. there is no other way. And there are situations where you have to, you know, your mm -hmm. um, a financial issue has happened or um, you need to move or you're being transferred. Then there's a reason, and yes, there are buyers out there, but when I shop with buyers in the winter, I'm going out and I'm saying, hey, there's a good chance we're going to get a deal on this as opposed to buying it in the spring. So I had a buyer who had no preference of when he bought, so we looked through the winter and we looked into the spring and we looked into the summer, and his comment was, hey, everything's a lot more expensive right now, right? Once we got to the summertime and past the spring, he couldn't find the same quality of house for the same price that we were looking at in January, because chances are they needed to sell or they had, they had been on the market for three months and their agent had asked them to reduce. I, I, I negotiate usually I, always hard, but in the winter, like I prepare my buyers yeah. to tell them that I'm going to be negotiating even harder. And I'm never in this negotiations are not for me to make friends with the other agent. It's to get my buyer the best possible price. And when a house has been on the market for three months and yeah. there's six feet of snow outside, you can, and I don't care if the person bought it two years before and they're going to be selling it for less than it's worth. 
uh, there's a reason they're listed in the winter. And usually you can, you could find that motivation through speaking to the agent and trying to, uh, using our tricks on the agent. And that's, you know, I, I think at Capital Homes, that's one thing that we, we do, uh, we don't, practice scripts or anything to go after our clients. We, yeah. we want to go after the other agent, take advantage of the other agent. And, uh, because that's legally, that's what we should be doing. Not a lot of people <laughs> go that route and not a lot of real estate training is geared towards, um, trying to screw the other agent, but that's how it should definitely be. Cause you need to protect your, your client. But in the winter, I love it because you can get these insane deals. Yeah. Like, and what would be, what would be one of the biggest, uh, discounts you ever got in the winter? We we got ten thousand dollars off of you know a house that wasn't you know a million dollar house you know it was a it was a smaller smaller condo and uh, and it was it was one of the townhouse condos and we got ten grand off and, and it was almost no issue like mm-hmm. it was fairly easy to get that money off and it didn't take any sort of renegotiating after the deal had been had been done it was right on the initial negotiation yeah um, I mean I think there's a huge opportunity and if if I'm saying that to my buyers, why am I telling sellers that it's a good time to buy? Right? You yeah. can't have it both ways. You can't say one thing to a buyer and one thing to a seller. If I'm telling my buyers that it's a good time to buy because we can get them a deal and we can get them, we can negotiate hard on it, why would I tell a seller that, oh, there's low inventory so we can probably put your house on the market and get you a great price for it? Yeah. Reality is you can't. Exactly. Yeah. So, And there's a lot of people out there saying, telling both stories, right? Yeah. It's a great time to list. We should list. There's low in, low inventory, yeah. and then those same people are going to go out and they're going to say uh, it's a great time to buy because we can get a really good deal yeah. and, and let's go hammer these really sellers. Hard. Yeah. yeah, let's exactly. go hammer these sellers with my buyers and let's go. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna sell it for top dollar, no problem in January. Yeah, complete. In- Horseshit. To agents, to agents, and inventory is important, right? Like you need, if you don't have any inventory, you don't have yeah. any listings out there. That's not not a lot of advertising. But at the end of the yeah. day, if you, I, I listened to a really uh, a really interesting segment on uh, why agents really do this. A lot of people believe that um, agents are greedy, but it's it's actually not necessarily greed but oftentimes desperation so uh, over 50 percent of real estate agents will sell four to five homes a year like you aren't paying your mortgage you will you will you will go bankrupt if that's the level of business you're doing in a full-time job so it's oftentimes they're advising their clients uh in the wrong direction because not that they're greedy or that they want the money is that they need the money and it clouds their, their, their vision. It's an important when you're, when you're hiring a listing agent or a buying agent, you definitely want to know how long they've been in the industry and how many transactions that they're, they're either on route to doing that year or how many they do per year and make sure that they're not lying. And it's something that I'm trying to develop uh, with the Ottawa referral group is to actually put this information in in buyers and sellers hands and interview the agents themselves full disclosure it is my group but i don't i don't refer out to anybody within my company because that would obviously be the wrong way to do it but we'll, i'll send them to different different people in ottawa different agents in ottawa uh and letting them know the statistics like there is no way of knowing how many agents are are how much business people are doing people are lying through their teeth and so people are getting screwed out of desperation because the agents are desperate to get that sale, right? Exactly. And that's a dangerous spot for, you know, for clients to be in is that, you know, you want to help, you want to help somebody that maybe you have a relationship with, maybe it's an acquaintance, somebody that you know, um, but you're putting a lot of faith in somebody who maybe has only been doing this for a short time and isn't one of the ones that's doing 10 or 15 sales in their first year. And exactly. you just, they just don't have, or, you know, We've all gone through the first year of real estate. We've all been right. New, exactly. So we've all we've all gone through. Yeah. yeah. Somebody's got to trust you, but you have to make sure they're not coming from a place of of desperation. Yeah. Right. That's when bad decisions get made, and you get pushed into a sale, and you get um, things get twisted a little bit. And legally, we can't we can't be doing that. Right. We're, we're an advan- at an advantage too, and which is part of the reason of the podcast is to shed light on some of these stories. And I don't want this to be the negative podcast, but definitely shine light on the positive and the, the negative things is we're privileged that we hear all these horror stories, but I've seen friendships thrown out the window, um, you know, on one particular case because the buyers went to a new build without their agent 
And they actually never ended up buying from that new build. But before they even did, the agent lost it on them. And because he, in his mind, he wouldn't get the commission down the road. He wouldn't get paid. Well, if if a friendship is 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 worth the commission, if that's what it's worth to you, then it's not really a friendship, right? Like I've, I've sent numerous people, if I'm unable to make it that weekend and I'm out of town and someone, re they really want to go, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, uh, put myself in the way of them getting that lot that they want or, yeah. you know, if I, I'm not available, but let's, so let's wait for me to get paid. You miss out on this opportunity because it's opening day of the new sales center. If I can't be there, I can't be there. It's in your best interest to go get the lot, get the home, get, you know, down the road, you'll, you, you're going to be uh, an advocate for me that I did the right thing for you. Right. I didn't screw you out of something for a paycheck. Yeah. I think there's just a, there's just a, a disconnect in the industry from doing what's right for the client and being um, service minded mm -hmm. as opposed to being transactional. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's that way in every industry, right? You're going to have, um, you know, you're going to have somebody that works on commission in a, in an electronic store that is only looking for the dollar. Yeah. Right. And you're going to have somebody in a restaurant who's trying to upsell everybody on every gravy, every, you know, extra shot, making it a double, and they're going to be at your table constantly trying to sell you on it without creating experience. And in real estate, you get the same kind of thing where, um, where, you know, people need to be taken care of very well and they mm -hmm. should be, and they deserve to be. It's not like it's small amounts of money that we're talking about. And if it's just a matter of getting them in, getting paid and on to the next one, then it's a pretty hard way to do business. You blame, you, I blame a lot of that on the training, right? Like the, the training that people are put through, a lot of them are put through training to be transactional. It's, it's yeah. you're new in real estate, let's get you a sale as quick as possible. How do you do so? You cold call, you do this, yeah. you use these scripts to get the sale right away. And then you become trans, you want, you're chasing that next sale, you're chasing that next sale. No one wants to wait six months to, to farm and yeah. take care of people and educate people and wait six months to, to make their first sale. So a lot of, a lot of the training is to get these people out of the gates uh, you know, with all, all guns blazing, but at the end of the day, if you're doing it to, to close your first deal and it doesn't matter what, what the outcome is at the end of the day, yeah. um, you know, if it's your first deal and it's going to fall apart on inspection, what do you do? Do you push it through and kind of try to hide the issues that came up or do you cancel the deal and wait another month and a half for that person to find a house? Like what's the right way to do it? We all know what the right way is to do it. Uh, but what's happening in the marketplace would, you know, would astound yeah. most people, most people in general. So, well, and I mean, I, it's not, it's not cheap to run a brokerage and it's mm -hmm. not, um, and it's not cheap to run a real estate business, right? Like mm -hmm. as an agent. So there are some pressures right at the beginning to doing that. And you can make money being a telemarketer and you can make money by spamming people. And that's why there's still telemarketers and that's why there's still spam emails mm -hmm. because you can make money that way. You can get business. Somebody is going to click on it. Somebody's going to answer the phone and you know, you're going to rope them in. You're going to trick them into, mm -hmm buying from you or using it. there's a huge disconnect and when i when i speak i it's one of my first slides is that real estate agents are businesses but there's a disconnect because they don't they they believe that they're real estate agents and that their job is to sell homes their job is not to sell homes you're running a business and when you look at statistically businesses it takes two to three years for a business to be profitable but yeah. for some reason, the business of being in, uh, in real estate, you should be making tons of money right off the bat, you know, 150K, 200K. Yeah. And it's, it's, is it possible? There is, there is one way for that to be possible. Yeah. And that's, you know, a lot of trickery and scripts and, uh, you know, cold calling. No one likes cold calling, no matter how much they say that they, it might bring them, bring them business. But at the end of the day, I, I've yet to meet someone that loves cold calling yeah. that can't wait to get up in the morning. Like you should be building your business over time to not have to ever do that stuff. Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's ludicrous for people to get into the industry and think that they're going to be, uh, financially stable, like right, right off the hop. Yeah. You know, the amount of people that come into the business and have zero runway and have no other source of income, like you don't need to have four months, uh, four months of living expenses saved up. Obviously, that's ideal. Probably six. I would say you or need eight yeah. <laughs> or twelve, 
um, just because commissions are typically 60 days away at minimum, mm -hmm. right? So if you have that saved up, that's great. If you have a secondary source of income, that's almost better, mm -hmm. right? Because you're, you still have one foot in the door and everybody says you shouldn't be a part-time agent. Yeah. But whether you have another job or not, at the beginning, you're a part-time agent. Yeah. And there's a reason that 90% of people drop out after, before three years. That, like, that, isn't, uh, that isn't made up. That is 80% yeah. of people or 50% of people won't make it to the two-year mark and even less make it to the three-year mark. It's because it's hard. And going four months without – you quit your job and you go four months without getting a commission check, yeah. um, that's going to put you out of business. And people – so – by chasing it and chasing it and you get more and it goes back to what I was saying, you get desperate. You don't, mm -hmm. it's not that you want that money. Now, now it becomes that you yeah. need that money. And that's when uh, dishonesty and loss of ethics happens because people need it. Yeah. So it's definitely, you know, I find me and Steve have very similar business models where we've built it, where I don't, we don't, need it we we don't need it because we've built a business where uh you know people just absolutely trust us and i know that if i have to bail on uh on a deal because it's something bad with the inspection that that client a will stay with me yeah forever because they know i'm doing the right thing for them but i have other clients coming down the road because i haven't spam them i haven't cold call them i haven't tricked them i've just generated over you know going on uh, over five years of just doing the doing the right thing yeah and that's it i mean it's it's just getting getting out there it takes longer there's no question about it mm -hmm. it takes longer to get out there put out some good content put out some some stuff that you know shows that you know what you're talking about but also that you're trustworthy yeah and then there's nothing nothing better than nothing works better than showing people that you're trustworthy, right? Yeah. Like, so you can walk away from three or four deals. That's fine. I don't yep. care. Like, I don't, I don't get attached to the outcome. I get attached to the relationship that we have. So if, you know, if four deals don't work because inspection, something came up on it, that's cool. I have zero issues. Some mm -hmm. people get upset. Some people might drive to your house and try and fight you, but <laughs> <laughs> that is a true story. Yeah, it's a true story. Not with um, us, not with us. Not with us. Um, but sometimes, you know, like these, these things happen when you need the money, you need the money. And I, and I, and I understand that it can be, it can be stressful putting every purchase on a credit card for three months. Yep. Like, you know, it's, it's stressful to do that or having a, a credit line that's maxed completely out. I've talked to you guys that, that have done this, but Keep something. Keep something that works with your real estate business and just be effective at your job. Like you can you can pretty easily do a second income as long as you have some systems in place and you have a support team that works. The, so. the when you look at solo, I'll take team take teams out of the out of the picture. Teams aside, because teams do generate a lot of cold calls and a lot of business is it's driven in a different way. Any successful individual agent ha that is still around. So when you have to, you remember 90% of people won't make it to 80, 90% of people won't make it to year three. The ones that did are not after, after three, four years, they're not, they're not doing that stuff. They've built the successful ones have built it over time and yeah. have a referral generated business that, you know, is self-sustaining as long as they don't, you can ruin your reputation pretty quick too. So it's something that you have to keep uh, doing over time, but it's because you've done it the right way. Like That's people it. always get, I, I love the phone calls where it's like, come on, Remy, like, let's, let's get this done. No, yeah. I'm not here to sell your listing. I'm yeah. here to, I'm here to do what's right for my buyer. And it's actually some, I love the trans those transactions. When you hear them say that, you know, you're going to get even a better deal for your client because you know that they're just going to do whatever it takes to sell that listing. Like, yeah. come on, look, come on. We're working on the same team. No, no, we're not. We're not yeah. working on the same team. Do we want to both get this house sold or get, you know, do, do we both have the same outcome in mind? You want to get this house sold. I want to get my clients a great house, but I'm not willing to do that at the expense of my clients. Exactly. Right? So yeah, we have the same goals. We, we both want to sell a house. That's, I mean, at the end of the day, that's our job, but my main goal is to keep them happy. Yeah. Right. Keep exactly. the client, the client happy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Not the other agent, but, um, so which brings me sometimes doing the, the brings us into the next, next thing that I wanted to talk about is the number of times when you're talking about selling a place and doing anything at the expense, you just want to get it sold. And a lot of people will oftentimes not, they get an offer and they're going to, they know that they're going to work it and they're, they don't, 
so many agents, this just happened to Steve this week um, or yesterday, I think, that the agent, Steve shows a house one day and then the next day it goes conditionally sold. So the offer was in place and they didn't contact and Steve's client would have come in and did a, put in a second offer. Your job is to create multiple offers, but, but a lot of people don't want, either they're lazy, they don't want to actually call every agent that's seen the place because they're happy enough. My happy, my client's happy because we have an offer, but what if you can get two, three, four offers, right? It just yeah. doesn't make any sense. Like if you elaborate on your story that just literally happened, I think yesterday was Yeah, it was, you know, it was, uh, we went to see a place, um, the client was was getting their finances in order, so we waited an extra day. And in the morning, I got an email saying, "Hey, it looks like it's been conditionally sold," um, because that's. But you showed that place. Right, showed it the day before or yeah. the night before. So she never let you, or he never let you know yeah. that there's an offer on the table. Exactly. There was no. There's no mention of it. Not not before the showing, or or during the showing, or after the showing. So um, now there there is another another piece of this too, because I've talked to a couple of different agents who believe that it's unethical in some way to try and rustle up another offer. And I don't, I mean, I don't, and I don't know the specifics of my, of my experience the other day. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe it was in their court and you well, know, th- it happened. This happens they should have let lot. me know either way, because maybe we wouldn't have gone to see it. If they said, you know what, it's almost a done deal. If they accept it, we're done. We yeah. probably still would have gone to see it, but we would have known. I could have set them up to say, we're probably not getting it, but it's it's worth taking a look at. It's a vacant yeah. property. Well, it happens but, a lot too. You see it yeah. on the Facebook page for the the realtors have like a closed group, and it's one of the most common complaints yeah. of people not being notified that an offer has been received. And I don't I don't understand the mentality of not rustling up yeah. another offer. Your you have a you have a legal duty to your client to get them the best possible price. And, yeah. and one of the only ways to get the best possible price and offer, and sometimes the price is in everything. So sometimes you can have a really crappy offer with a great price yeah. um, that can actually wor- work against your seller. But your job is to rustle up multiple offers. That's, it. that's the only way you're going to get an offer that has the best price with the least amount of conditions with the, it's the only way you're going to get the best possible offer is when you've got, multiple to choose from yep. when you only have one offer you're 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 really you're stuck not necessarily accepting those terms but you're only negotiating against those those well, one terms much less leverage right yeah. so but yeah when i've talked to other agents about it i'm like we talk about the 24 hour um irrevocable so you have 24 hours to respond to an offer right yeah. that's in a lot of listings and it says you know that's one of our listing conditions and whatever else as far as I can tell, it goes in for a couple of different reasons. It goes in because they want more time. Mm-hmm. Maybe they're very busy and they want more time. They, they, and then, or they want it to, because uh, the client's out of town or not available all the time, which is fair, or it's so that they can get another offer, mm-hmm. right? So as a buyer rep, I try to put it as low as possible, mm-hmm. right? I try to give as little time as possible because I don't want a second offer coming in. Exactly. As, as a listing agent, I'll put that in because I want to make sure that I can get I have, I have some time to rustle it up. And I've, I've mentioned this to a couple other agents that are like, wow, that's kind of, you know, that, that doesn't seem right. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, why wouldn't you be working? It's your job to get more. If I've had, if I've listed a property on Saturday and I had eight showings on Sunday yeah. and Sunday more, or I have eight showings booked Sunday morning and someone comes in Sunday morning and gives me an offer and he says, "I we really, really want it. I'm only giving you till noon." Well, no, I've got I've got eight other showings this afternoon. It's a hot list. I'm not exactly. selling it to the first guy because maybe maybe I priced it at three ninety nine because it's actually worth four twenty. And yeah. you know, this has worked in a lot of situations where you price the home so well that it will sell for market value. We'll sell over asking because it's it's going to sell. The market will will dictate what the house is going to sell for yeah. in a way. But you're doing it. I'm not letting you muscle your offer in in the morning when I'm asking for 24 hours because maybe I do have in the next 24 hours I've got three other showings and yeah I do want to rustle up I don't what would be interesting and part of the podcast we are going to be bringing uh, some some business owners around town but also I want to bring in uh, more agents and yeah. I'd love to get if we can find an agent in Ottawa that would be willing to come and talk uh, about this specific that believes in, in not having, not rustling up, uh, more offers. We'd yeah. love to have you over and have, exactly. That's what the, this podcast is going to be about is to shed the light on all the different, um, 
all the different scenario situations and um, hot topics that are related to it. Real estate is, there's an emotional attachment with the public and real estate. There's so many, there are so many real estate shows and it's why a lot of people get romantic with, oh, maybe I should get my license. It seems so easy. And the reason there's a 90% dropout rate is because it's not easy. It's not, people... It's why no one, not everyone should be running a business. It's the same. Not everyone is made to run a business, but that's what real estate is. And I think people believe it's a job, but being a real estate agent is not a job. You've just opened up your own shop. You've just opened up your own business. Do you have, you're the marketing department. You are the admin. You are the graphic design. You're, you're in charge of everything. And then on top of that, you need to facilitate everything to, for, for a transaction or for a sale while giving excellent customer. So you're everything you are the, you're, you're the Rogers customer service agent. You're, you're (laughs) everything that encompasses a business and people just don't tend to to understand that. So we want to bring in other agents. We want to challenge the status quo and uh, shed some light on the serious issues of real estate. So I'd love to, what we'll do is we will end it on that with this topic of um, 24 hours irrevocable on offers and trying to rustle up another, uh, another offer. And we will bring that topic back at a later podcast uh, once we can find someone that wants to uh, discuss that topic Uh, so Steve thank you so much guys if you like it please leave a comment if you hated it if you're pissed off at us leave us a comment Uh, we will gladly respond to your comments and maybe even uh, discuss it on the next podcast so until next week guys I appreciate it and uh, this is real talk real estate we're going to be uncovering the truth about a lot of stuff that's going on not just in Ottawa, but across the real estate industry. So thank you guys so much for listening to the first podcast, uh, episode three, the other two video ones, one on investing. Um, the first episode was on, uh, investing in, uh, investment properties. And, uh, this is the first podcast. So hope you, hopefully you enjoyed it and we'll see you guys next week. Thanks. See you later.